Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's a little daunting to ask a, uh, a lawyer to uh, uh, briefly illuminate, but we'll do our best. Uh, this is an extraordinary panel on what has come to be an extraordinary topic, and uh, MOOC mania is probably an appropriate term to what's been going on. Uh, a week does not pass that there's not a story in the major media about uh, something occurring in the world of, of MOOCs. Uh, interestingly, a report just came out a few days ago by one of the major investment houses, uh, BMO, the former Bank of Montreal, on education technology. And the first part of their discussion of technology in post-secondary education talks about MOOCs. Earlier in the day, there was a reference to MOOCs as uh, something of a tsunami. And I think that's the wrong analogy, because a tsunami wipes everything away. It doesn't leave anything in its, in its place. And Stephen Jay Gould, the uh, evolutionary biologist, had a much better term, I think, and that's punctuated equilibrium. Things stay at a certain level, and then something changes. And a change occurs. And that change, for example, gave the mammals a leg up and ultimately took over from the dinosaurs. But not completely. The alligators are still around. The birds are still around. What we may be looking at at this point is a punctuated equilibrium created by MOOCs that is enough to make the change that shifts a system that has been, as our previous speakers said, pretty much the same for generations. A panel comes from across the spectrum of, of learning, generally online learning in particular. Andrew Eng is the co-founder and uh, co-CEO of Coursera. And if there's anyone here who does not know what Coursera is, you are actually in the wrong session. <laughs> uh, Susan Cates who is the executive director of the MBA at UNC, the Keenan Flagler, Keenan Flagler Business School of the University of North Carolina. And Susan previously was a person in private equity who was involved in the design and build of education enterprises. Candace Thiel is the director of the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University. And Jim Applegate is the Vice President for Program Development of the Lumina Foundation. This is going to be a conversation. We're going to start with a very brief presentation by the panelists in terms of where they're coming from in the conversation. And from there on out, I hope we will have a very freewheeling discussion. We'll start with Andrew. Thank you, Michael. So as um, That's my slides. bring up my slides? Okay. So as Michael mentioned, I'm a Stanford professor and co-founder of Coursera. Most people today will never have access to a Stanford class, but we're changing that. Working with such great schools as Stanford, Caltech, Columbia, Penn, and others, we're taking courses from all of these great schools and putting them online, free for anyone to take. We're using technology to offer high-quality education at scale. Let me share with you my story. As a Stanford professor, I normally teach a 400 student Stanford class. When we first launched this, I put my class online and reached an audience of 100,000 students. Um, to put that number in context, in order for me to reach a comparable size audience, I would otherwise have had to teach my normal Stanford class for 250 years. <laughs> So why do so many students want to take our classes? I think it is that first and foremost, they were real courses. It begins on a certain day. It runs for a fixed period of time, 10 weeks in the case of my class. Um, this was a plot of a web traffic as my class progress over time. And those heartbeats, those peaks, correspond to homework deadlines. Predictably, the 24 hours before homework is due, web traffic spikes, thus proving procrastination is a global phenomenon. <laughs> Finally, if a student completes a homework and meets a high grading bar, they also receive from us a certificate or similar that they can put in their resume and use to find a better job. Um, let me quickly show you what our videos, what our courses look like. Like many others, we use video-based instruction. No, oh, apologize. Looks like video's not playing. Like many others, we use videos-based instruction with 
um, instructors recording usually 10 minute videos to post online to deliver the content. But the class is much more than just lectures and students learn best not by passively listening but by practicing with the material. All of our classes usually tend to have a weekly, serious weekly homeworks as well, such as a short answer, math derivation, programming exercises, structured grading, where you can have students say build a financial model on a spreadsheet and we auto grade that. Um, beyond these auto-graded homeworks, you know, not everything can be auto-graded. We also developed a sophisticated peer grading formalism that enables students to be assigned more open-ended work, like write a 300-word essay on a business plan, or write a 300-word essay on a history, recent historical event. And um, our peer graded system allows students to grade each other's work and get feedback on more open-ended homeworks. Um, the peer grading technology, as well as, the, as well as the others, has been key to enabling us and our partner universities to offer a broad range of courses that span the humanities, the social sciences, the basic sciences, engineering, business, law, medicine, finance, and other areas. Um, since we launched the company in April, um, I guess we've announced partnerships with 33 universities. Uh, we Today, we have about 200, over 200 courses. We reached our first 1 million students faster than the Facebook, and it took us another four months after that to double to 2 million. Um, I think this is not because we're anything special, frankly, but rather this speaks more to a societal need for affordable, high-quality education. And with our reach of universities, courses, and students, we are today by far the largest MOOC called Massive Open Online Courses platform. Just to wrap up, I've often been asked, if anyone can go online and take a Princeton class for free, why on earth would anyone still pay $200,000 for a Princeton degree? I think the answer is that the real value of attending a top university is not just the content. Content is increasingly free on the web anyway. I think the real value of attending a top school is the interactions of the professors and the interactions with other equally bright students. To quote Plutarch, I think the mind is not a vessel that needs filling, but wood that needs igniting. Most of our partner universities are using their course content to move the content conveyor, the lecture component of a class, onto a website that students can watch from home. And what this does is it preserves the classroom time for more of the interactions, the deep interactions, that I think is the real value of attending a top school. Over the last year, I've gone to a lot of countries and spoken with a lot of people about education. Um, I found to my surprise that even today, a lot of people still say that a high quality education is only for the elite. Even today, a lot of people still say that a high quality education is only for the privileged. I think that a high quality education is a fundamental human right, and with technology, we're working to bring that to everyone. Thank you. Susan. Thanks. Um, so I will do this without slides um, and, uh, and, and won't get up and move around a bit. As, um, as Mike said, I'm a recovering investment banker. I'm not an academic by background, although I'm here representing an academic institution, which I love, certainly. Um, I oversee our MBA at UNC program, which is, um, although Andrew, Andrew pushes back every time I say this, if you put us on a continuum, I think we're actually... Um, uh, sort of two different sides of a, of a similar movement to bring high quality education um, to, uh, from great universities to students around the world, but we're doing it in a very, in a very different way than Coursera. When we launched, when we announced MBA at UNC in November 2010, the world was a very, very different place with respect to um, with respect to <coughs> top-tier universities moving into full-blown degree programs and offering, um, offering education that we said was going to be the same quality, the same curriculum, the same faculty, the exact same admission standards as our top 20 ranked MBA program. And at the time, that was sort of, that was seen as a, as a bold move and seen by, by some as a crazy move. Um, and what the MOOC movement has done over the last two years is has drastically shifted public perception a away from people thinking that that's, a, that that's a bold move to people feeling like top universities must be thinking about how to deliver access and, and, um, and deliver education to people who aren't picking up and moving to where they are. Um, so we are very grateful for, the, for that shift in, in perception. Our first student started an MBA at UNC in July of 2011. 
We're up to 320 students um, in the program. We are, um, we are most definitely not free. The degree costs about $91,000. It is also not open access. It's a very rigorous application and admission selection process as it is for any of our MBA programs. Um, one of the differences, though, in, um, in what we're doing versus the open access courses is that whereas um, open access courses and many traditional degree programs delivered online have, uh, have high attrition, low persistence rates, a year and a half into this program, our attrition is about 1%. Um, and and, and uh, it's, it, it, that's something that we're very, very proud of. And we think the combination of the ways that we have designed the degree program and really leveraged technology, leveraged our, our fantastic faculty, like the same faculty that, that, that you all use as you think about how to deliver great quality education, but also deliver a very intensive learning experience in the live courses that, that our partner um, Chip Posek mentioned earlier, where students are face-to-face -face every week in a small group of no more than 15 students, 15 students that have all been sort of hand-selected to be part of this program, led by one of the faculty members, um, with a lot of accountability um, built into that is something that's, that's really meaningful. Um, we also deliver, as part of the programs, opportunities for students to come together face-to-face -face around the world that are options for them to be able to, to enhance the network and, the, and the, the bonds that they build over the, um, over the course of the program. I'm also um, overseeing our UNC's efforts as part of Semester Online, which again, I think, owes, owes quite a lot in terms of um, uh, uh, in terms of Coursera and others really paving the way for acceptance for great universities to do things that are, um, that are seen as a little different than the way we've always done things. So um, I'm going to invite the, both the moderator and the group here to keep me honest, because we agreed to two slides in more than three minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to try and do that. So if I could get back to my, how do I get backwards? So I don't get to, don't start the clock until I get to where I start. <laughs> uh, while I'm doing that, I want to ask, how many people during the course of this morning spent some time not just listening to the speakers, but texting or doing your email or taking notes? Honestly, yeah. Because because what we know is this form of people just standing up here talking to you isn't the most, for, most effective way of learning. And what, I'm the director of the Open Learning Initiative, and what we do when we're designing these open learning environments is we don't have a single faculty member just record them and say, how do you teach it, go teach it. We bring together teams of faculty domain experts, software engineers, uh, scientists who study human learning. Because as who was, what was said earlier today, we've learned more about how people learn in the last 20 years than in all the rest of human history. And that we're not using that information to inform how we teach is, is abominable. So we bring together these teams, we create these learning environments, but then the real power of these environments, we make them openly available, anybody can use them. The real power of the environments is what I call the killer app, which is? It's a surprise. There we go. I got it. Oh, um, went uh, one further. There we go. That um, the power of this technology is what Google figured out. It's what Netflix figured out. It's what Amazon figured out. You push out the environment just far enough for the learner to interact with it so you can collect all that data about the learner to know more about that learner. Not just that individual learner, but learners as a group. And then you use that data to give feedback to the actors in the system. One is to the student themselves. Do I know what I'm doing? How am I doing? How do I do it better? To the teacher, who can get then all the information about the students they're supporting so they can target their instruction to the needs of their students. And then to the course design team, because the first time we do a course, that's just our best guess based on the research about how to do it well. And we collect the data to find out how to make it better and better and better. And the third, fourth feedback loop is to science of learning. Understanding how to use these environments, understanding how learning happens is a research question. And we need to use these environments to collect that data, to feed it back into our universities, to do that research so that we can improve education for everyone. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, uh, everyone else here has
as a, a thing, a, a killer app, a, um, a delivery system, a cost system, you have something which in many respects may be more powerful than all of it, and that is the, the money to, <laughs> money is a good thing, by the way, we're gonna put a big dollar sign up, to influence change. Well, I, I do have a killer data, piece of data that I want to share with you, and it, it, it's why you ask us, Michael, to spend our three minutes talking about why are we, why am I here? Because <laughs> I don't have a device, I don't have a device, I don't have an online course. Uh, so here's the killer piece of data in the 2010 census, among 24-year-olds in the United States, among 24-year-olds in the upper-income quartile, four out of five have a four-year college degree. If you're rich, not getting a college degree requires you to get addicted to cocaine, fall off the cruise boat, or some, and some, have other, some other horrible thing happen to you. Among the lowest income quartile, one out of 10 has a four-year college degree. We have a system of higher education, and I spent 20 years as a professor, I've, I've come out of that system, uh, that today is largely, in the words of one New York Times reporter, a system for reproducing privilege. Uh, not a system that provides opportunity to those who need it most. And so why am I here today? Because we do believe that there, because of some of the changes that are occurring, some of the new technological capacities that are available, we can make changes in the system that will open that system up to opportunity. Because unless you believe that the wealth of, of the family into which someone is born is what, oh, sure. Is, is, uh, is what defines their ability to contribute in, uh, their, to this country, uh, we've got a really screwed up situation. And so technology, what, what we hope is, is whether, our, our, Lumina, by the way, in case you don't know, is the largest foundation in the United States, solely focused on one goal, which is to get more people into post-secondary education and out with a high quality degree that improves their lives, both economically and otherwise. Uh, we, this is all crystallized around something we call Goal 2025, which is to have the United States workforce be made up of, with 60% of the United States workforce by 2025 to have high quality post-secondary credentials. We've been stuck at 40% for about several decades, several decades. Uh, we seem to be comfortable with that. Part of the reason we're comfortable with that, I think, is because there are underlying uh, classist and racist assumptions that undergird the way we do education in this country. People, some people don't get those degrees because of who they are, not because of a system that systematically distorts the opportunity structure. So that's what we're trying to change. And we believe that technology has a role to play. It's not the silver bullet, but it has a huge role to play. I think it is valuable when Stanford and the Coursera and edX, UNC, when institutions like that, as, as, as Susan, I think, correctly says, change the conversation. Because if we're going to pull this off, we're going to have to make education available at lower cost and more accessible to people who live real lives, who don't, don't go to college, and sit, only 25% of the current higher education population goes full time and lives in a dorm. 25%. 75% have families, kids, part time, they're doing other, they have other things in their lives. So we have to design a system that can meet people where they are. I think we've heard some good, op good options today, but that's the vision. And our, if we can help make that happen, then we're happy to be a part of this, this conversation as a partial solution to that problem. I do believe that if we don't keep that vision right at the forefront, that there is a chance that all this technological change could actually aggravate the inequities that currently, and it could aggravate the fact that the haves will have more and the have-nots will be even further left behind. At a time when a college education is, despite some of what you read from misinformed people about the college bubble and is college worth it anymore, the data is clear. A college education, and when I say college, I'm including certificates, two-year degrees, four-year degrees, is more economically valued to valuable today than it has ever been in the history of this country, and it's getting more valuable at a faster rate than it's ever gotten. So everybody we leave out is doomed to a life of being working poor. So that's the vision. So how do we use these new capacities that we have to open the system up, drive down cost, and make it available. And frankly, the value of institutions like Stanford and UNC and others in changing the conversation is great. But all those institutions that Andrew had listed there that they're a part of, they aren't going to solve this problem. Between them, they don't teach enough students to make a, even a small dent in the 23 million students. So now if they can begin to engage in the kind of work like Coursera and turn that into credentialed learning that actually helps people 
succeed at the next phase of their lives, we may be talking about a new ballgame. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to think about and learn from you about what's happening in the, in the latest and greatest versions of student support capacities, academic learning, competency-based delivery of education that can help us achieve this goal. Because if we do not achieve this goal, the consequences are dire. The economy will stagnate, the democracy will sicken, and the United States will no longer be anything like a relevant player in the, in the, in the global economy. Thank you. That, that ties perfectly into the way this session is captioned. It's not making MOOCs matter, how to enroll 10 million students, or how to or making MOOCs matter, how to make a billion dollars. It's making MOOCs matter, how do you assess learning, how do you certify learning, how do you credential learning. In the context of something different from people sitting with someone up front with a whiteboard, I was going to say blackboard, um, taking notes, putting down every word, changed paradigm, but achieving the same result. How do we get to that point in the context that Jim has indicated, which is economically feasible <coughs> so that the 23 million excluded become the 23 million included? Andrew, let me start with you. Sure, so you know, I completely agree with uh, Jim's vision of education for, every, education for all. Um, I think the two populations of students that, that often, I often think about, one is the, the wealthy, for want of a better word, well, the people that for whatever access have, for whatever reason have access to Susan's Business School, to the Stanfords, the Princetons, the Caltechs of the world. For the foreseeable future, they will get a better education than anyone else, because it is what it is. If you are wealthy, you will probably end up with a better education. But what I think all of us want to do is to narrow the gap, so that even the poorest and the neediest in the society can have access to a high quality education as well. I think there are several ways we should do that. One is, um, as, as Candace said, the lecture, you know, the, the guy standing in front of the room, is a really inefficient way of delivering content. And I think content is increasingly, can increasingly be placed onto the web. Uh, there are community, community colleges and also high schools um, experimenting with the flipped classroom where they can get content from someone else, from a great teacher in the world, and then have a local instructor provide a lot of the high-touch one-on-one mentoring to ensure that especially the neediest student actually succeed and get through the system and get the degrees. I think this is a viable model for bringing down the cost of a college degree. There's been a lot of talk about a $10,000 college degree. Uh, four years of tuition being $10,000. And I think this is a viable model for going towards that. And then there are the people that are even more needy, that cannot even afford to go to a community college. And for them, um, hopefully we can afford to give every one of them a computer. And I think we are actually getting there. Uh, so, uh, visiting, chatting with some friends from India recently, and they handed me the Akash tablet, which is an Android tablet that will sell for $20. When I hold that in my hands, I feel like the world doesn't know what's gonna hit it. When every student has a $20 tablet and can, can, can have access to a free online class, even if not quite to a community college, I think, I think the world is about to change. Yeah, I would say that um, in the title, it struck me there was something missing in the title of this session. Um, we didn't ask about supporting learning or supporting education, just assessing credentialing. Um, and so one of the things that I think is important is we're looking at how do we credential what people are doing in the online environment? How do we use these technologies actually to be able to support people to learn better? Um, and I think that's where I think the big data collection question comes in. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think that's because what we have to, there have to be some changes. The technology can help make changes in the system, but it's not the technology that is the change. So we have to move to a system that is learning outcome based, where degrees and credentials are transparently defined in terms of the learning they're supposed to encapsulate. So when I accomplish that learning, I get that certification. Whether I did it in six months or two years or I did it over a period of time, if we can open the system up to that kind of competency-based learning outcomes, then I think a lot of the, this makes the utilization of some of the technologies that you are talking about. But right now we're trapped in this credit hour, seat time, semester-based system where, I mean, Candace, in your work, you're able to get students in, with, with the new, the, what you described here very briefly, uh, but you're able to get students 2x learning. You're able to get students through to where they would normally be at the end of a semester, see if I get this right, and tell me, about halfway through the time of the semester. Right. But when they do that, what do they do next? I mean, because what they've got to, I suspect in most institutions, they've got to sit around and wait for two or three months till the next stack course is off for this sequential stack course. So uh, actually, that's, what's interesting to me, our, our environments, we're not 
uh, creating a separate structure from um, traditional higher education. The environments that we create are openly available and used by institutions all over the country. And the same stat course that you're talking about that we did these accelerated learning studies in, where we did demonstrate that students using the OLI statistics course along with um, a, uh, an instructor were able to complete the course um, in eight weeks instead of 15 weeks with two instructor contact hours instead of four instructor contact hours a week. So it was actually a double acceleration. Um, that same course, that same learning environment is used by community colleges, by Bryn Mawr, by Research One, UCLA, Berkeley, I mean, multiple institutions using the same learning environment, but they use that accelerated property very differently. Um, in one of the liberal arts colleges, they did the accelerated mode. Students went, worked through the entire statistics course in eight weeks, but then they used the next seven weeks to do projects um, that were meaningful to them, that they used the power of what they learned in the statistics environment and still had that environment there as a resource to go back and learn from when they weren't quite sure what a t-test was or how do I use it. So the point is, is that these, um, these environments can change what you do in a traditional classroom really effectively. But, but, we would, but, but I was going to say, if we, but, but, and that's, that's a great use of that additional time, but overall we're still trapped in this semester credit hour. Our financial aid system is defined that way, so if students were to enter a competency-based course and be able to move at a quick level, they can't get the financial aid that they need because they haven't demonstrated seat time. As one of my friends used to say, if you're focused on seat time for a student, you're focused on the wrong end of the student. And so we, we need to start focusing <laughs> on the right end of the student. And as they learn, we let them progress at whatever rate they learn. It will make the system much more efficient, much more productive, and much less costly for the student and for the institutions as well. Right. I mean, the environments are that same statistics course is also used by Western governors. Right. And so that's a much more open, just competency-based, when you finish it, you're done. Yeah, Susan. So. Yeah, Susan. Yeah, Susan. Yeah, Susan. It, it, Leaving aside the, the issue of, of credit hours and all that, which I don't disagree with, but I think is sort of a, a bigger thing than, 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 than we're in a place to address at this moment, I think that we're, what we're seeing is certainly the same as what you're seeing in terms of the effectiveness of what you're able to deliver in terms of learning being even better in a, in a technology-enhanced environment than it can be in a classroom environment both more efficient but, but, uh, but deeper and offering opportunities to be able to, um, to teach more deeply, to teach more effectively. As we continue to build out our, our courses, being able to offer sort of an accordion approach to concepts that are difficult concepts so that if a student gets time value of money the first time through when our finance professor explains it, then they move on to the next thing. But if they don't, then they see a graphical illustration of it. And then they see a different example that, that approaches it from a different way so that you're able to, to reach different learning styles um, and really give people an opportunity to dig as deep as they want to or to be able to move quickly when they, um, when they get through things. It gives an opportunity to, um, to teach better in a technology and enhanced environment. Andrew, let me follow on something that you said, which I think is fascinating. You said that if a student in India, a poor student in India can get a $20, $20 tablet, that that will transform learning. The question is, you have 200 million students who have that tablet who can then access open courses, then what? How does one translate that into an educational system? Yeah, you know, I think ultimately, um, uh, when a student knows, when a student has acquired knowledge, we need a way to find them jobs, right? I mean, and we all know education is much more than just jobs, it's about citizenship, it's about other things as well, critical thinking, but what many students enter our education system for is because they want jobs and be able to make a livelihood. Um, I think that this mass education MOOCs is still in its early stages. I've been surprised at how seriously employers are already taking our informal certificates. You know, we, we were, when a student does the homework, we print out a certificate with caveats at the bottom that were saying, we don't know if the student actually is who he or she claims he is. And, and students have been proudly listing those on their resumes and successfully using them to find better jobs. Uh, one other, other interesting development is that ACE, the American Council for Education, the most respected organization of its type in the United States, has been starting to review uh, some of the Coursera MOOCs um, 
for credit equivalency. What that means is that if they make a positive credit recommendation in the coming months, what that means is that some of these students from all around our country uh, will be able to take a online class, maybe go into a proctored exam or something, um, and then have that transferred for academic credit into a, any of our ACE's, potentially up to any of ACE's 1800 university partners and obtain credit that is good for a degree. So that's a direct path to the degree, which is still the coin of the realm for helping students find better jobs. Um, but for adult learners, uh, the, especially ones that already have a degree, I think the, the, the certificates we've been printing out um, actually are also helping students show to potential employers that they've learned these things and are helping students find better jobs. I, I want to pick up on something Candace said too. I mean, I know we're rightly focusing on the way in which this can enhance the delivery of high quality learning and then credentialing that learning. but. You know, it's, it's got to be more than just the, the learning outcomes, the student support piece. The, the, I mean, there are 36 million adults in the workforce right now with some college and no degree. They went to college, uh, tens of millions of them actually have more than 60 credits, and they left with nothing except perhaps debt. We're in our, we haven't been able to interview all 36 million, but in our studies of those folks, most of them did not drop off the path because of academic failure. They dropped off the path because they got confused in the middle of this thing we call this wonderfully choiceful higher education system, which is just is actually a, a morass of complexity, uh, too much choice. We've all seen the psychology on that. That that takes a particularly first generation low income students and and throws them off out of out of where they're headed. So. What we, we can use, the other area we're really interested in looking at this technology is not just in terms of learning and outcomes and credentialing, but the, the e-portfolios that we just heard about is a good example, but how can we use this to uh, use data analytics and other methods to target the kinds of support in a really just-in-time way, and there are already platforms that are beginning to develop around this, so that if a student at a university misses two classes in a week and gets picked up for a drunken disorderly downtown, that data goes into a system, you know that immediately, and you have a system ready to intervene and figure out what's going on with that student. You don't wait till the end of the semester to count the dead bodies and say, oh look, 40% of them left. I wonder what that's all about. We should probably do something about that. Let me, so let me, I, I think the student support piece is equally important to the academic credentialing learning piece yeah, in, let me, in this environment. Let me pose one further question to the panel, then I want to go to the audience for questions. The conversation has taken an interesting turn in that we start with the innovation of, of open courseware and of open courses. What we've migrated to, we translated into credits. We translated into the coin of the realm and we shoehorn it back into the system that every one of you has said is not really the best system for enhancing learning, making learning accessible. Are we, in fact, on the cusp of a significant change in education, or are we looking at new technology that is simply going to further what we already have? And with the problems that we already had, the gym that you discussed. You know, I think, I think um, degrees, especially from good schools, will be incredibly valuable for a long time to come. I think what we're seeing is that other things are also starting to be valuable um, within industry, Within certain segments, people have been using, starting to use things other than degrees to evaluate candidates, uh, like portfolios. Turns out, if you hire a designer today in Silicon Valley, you almost don't care what degree they have. You almost entirely look at the portfolio. Uh, whether we like it or not, the world is moving towards more informal forms of uh, accreditation, and I think students now just have more ways of distinguishing themselves. And maybe to kind of wrap up all the things that uh, uh, Susan and, and Jim both said, you know, I think today our education system, um, what has held constant is the amount of time you spend. I, I think it was actually Sal Khan that first, some, first said something very profound, which is that what is, in our education system, what has held constant is the amount of time you spend in your seat. Uh, what is variable is the amount you get it. Maybe you get it, you're an A student, maybe that guy doesn't get it, so he's a B student and that, that's, that's a C student. But I think it should be the other, the other way around. And uh, what should be held constant is that every student should succeed, every student should get it, every student should be an A student, and what can be, held, what can be variable is the amount of time you need to spend on something before you get it. And I think competency-based learning, which Jim was describing, um, um, is one way to move us towards that model. Yeah, Mike, I, I think it would be a stunningly radical change in American higher education if credentials, I mean, I think we're still going to need credentials of some sort. Somebody's got to validate 
I mean, I, now, the market will determine which of those, I mean, when the employers decide that badges are valuable, then they will be valuable, or, or whoever that demand side of the house is. But, but, on the, but, just, but I think it would be a radical shift if we were able to use the technology to really enable us to focus on the learning, as you were saying, as the constant, and, and, and define the credential, not by seat time, not by hours, not by credits, but by learning that is visibly available to the, to, to the consumer. That would be, that would turn higher education on its head. I mean, that, that eliminates the credit hour, for goodness sake. So I, I, I don't think it's like shoehorning it into the current system. If we do that, if this helps do that, we have, we've blown this, we, we have blown the system wide open in terms of uh, a, a student-centered focus on student learning, not a class-centered focus and a time-centered focus and a faculty and institution-centered focus. If we can pull that off, I'll retire. So I think it'll be past the time you retire. I, 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 I'm philosophically in full agreement with you that we ought to be focused on outputs versus inputs, both in terms of how we evaluate institutions, how we evaluate the providers of learning, and how we evaluate students. And I am generally optimi an optimist by nature. I have absolutely no faith whatsoever that the Department of Ed is going to blow up the credit hour in the entire way that we, that we go about evaluating degrees. And, I, and like you, I believe that the degree, that degrees in formal learning will continue to have a significant place for, for quite a while to time. I, I, I think it'll be past the time that my daughter retires and she's three that we're talking about oh, that sort wait, of massive. Let's go to the audience. For okay, the bomb's been, to, the bomb's been tossed ahead. out there. It's floating over our heads. Questions? Hi, uh, Cable Green from Creative Commons. Uh, Jim and Candace, you both talked about uh, the use of data <clears throat> and data analytics and what can we do specifically when we have data. So, and Candace, maybe you could talk a little bit about what, what would be possible if, as we're collecting data on people learning, what's possible with that data if it was shared and if we actually collaborated and put it in some repository and ran analytics on it? What, what does that look like? So I think it gets to the um, issue that Susan raised. She said, you know, someone gets stuck in a particular concept and they get stuck. Um, how do we know, and, and right now, she said, well, we give them this representation or this representation or this representation to help them try and get past that stuck place. And we do that kind of random, give them this, give them this, give them that, because we don't really understand yet how to get people conceptually past a lot of those stuck places. What we can do with the data is if we create these learning environments so that we are tracking what students are doing and as, when they're needing help, when they're getting stuck, and then giving them an intervention to help them get past that stuck place. And we can collect data to figure out in what context, according to what variables, it really fine grains what's working and what's not working so that we can use that information to better design our learning experiences. And we can do that at a real nano level and we can keep building that together and combining it with the larger analytic data that most people are interested in. I'm interested in that nano level um, to create, to really know how to educate people on a massive scale in a very individualized kind of way. So, we don't know how to do that yet. And that's what, but in order to do that, we have to have large amounts of data with large amounts of students, not just students taking a course at Carnegie Mellon. Um, we need the students that are taking the course at Miracosta Community College. And we need to look at all of those data together, and that's a huge N. And we could do lots of analysis and, and, and sort of blow out what we know about learning. But we only can do that if we have huge repositories of open data that lots of researchers have access to. So can I, I want to I agree with uh, Candice by telling a quick story that there's an instance of everything she just talked about. So um, in my machine learning class, uh, the first time it's when I told, put it online, funny thing happened to me. Um, I assigned a programming exercise, and 2,000 students submitted the same wrong answer. Um, this has never happened to me before. Imagine if you're an instructor and 2,000 students submit the same wrong answer. How would you feel? Um, so we looked at the sub student submissions and found that everyone we looked at had exchanged two steps of a mathematical algorithm and done it in the wrong order. This allowed us to go back and generate a custom error message so that when the 2001st student submitted the same wrong answer, 
we gave them a custom error message telling them, you know, consider the order in which you do these two steps. This allowed them to correct the misconception much more quickly. So if you think about it, if uh, in a small standard class, if two out of 100 students had submitted the same wrong answer, you probably won't even notice. But it's when 2,000 out of 100,000 students submit the same wrong answer, that's what gives the instructor a very strong signal to be that there's something to be looked at here. So I think it's actually ironic that in order to achieve personalization at the level of giving students a targeted feedback message that tells them exactly what the misconception is, in order to achieve personalization, what was needed was to teach a massive class because that's what gave us the data to achieve personalization. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, John Idelson, this morning I said it might be nicer rather than calling MOOCs massive online courses, we called them meaningful online courses. You know, the press like Insider Higher Ed and other presses, you know, the MOOC is the big word. What would you really like to call this movement if you were able to pick how you would describe it in a headline? I think, oh, I would, I, I think we're stuck with the term. Uh, we could call them Coursera courses, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. good, good guess. <laughs> yeah, Michael, oh, fine. Is, is there oh, another question? Sure. There was a question here, and then I'll be uh, Peter Smith, I, I was interested when um, Michael asked the question about real disruption and a conversation that had been all about uh, the future and the horizon all of a sudden fractured into four, or five, four opinions that were, uh, in some cases, much more conservative. And it strikes me, um, I'll pick on you, Candy. Candace, because I know you a little bit, and I'm not going to really pick on you. Uh, yes, about all, all the things you said about data, absolutely. And uh, in terms of the dean, uh, yes, about the pace of change uh, in some higher education. But do any of you really believe that higher education, as we understand it today, controls or can deflect or control the forces that are driving radical change in the way the education higher ed proposition, its value proposition is being unbundled and rebundled in multiple ways. Because it sounds, those, it sounds like we still, some of us still think we're going to actually going to control this. My belief is on the other side of that line. I'm just interested, I, I think we're going to try to make sense out of it, cope with it, adapt to it. But uh, I don't see, I think the days are over when the academy in any form can control what happens beyond its boundaries. And I'm wondering how you feel about that. I, I just I, want to note what Susan said at the, at, briefly in her conversation. She said, not that the institutions aren't going to allow it. The Department of Education is not going to allow it. Is this an issue of the academy or is this an issue of government policy? But I, I, so I agree with you. I don't believe that the that universities are able to control it. I think universities have been spectacularly slow to catch up to um, to where the world is going, and and that's actually part of the thing that's so exciting about what's happened just over the last two years. As I mentioned, the world today versus the world just two years ago when we announced our program is drastically different. And frankly, we were behind the curve when we announced this program. If you think of the rest of the world outside of, uh, outside of higher education institutions. So I'm in full agreement with you that universities will have to, um, will have to move along. I have, I, as slow and stuck as universities tend to be in terms of moving quickly, um, I, have, I have all the less confidence in our political institutions is exactly the point I was making, as Michael's Well, in, 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 in defense of the Department of Education, uh, there are a lot of people at the Department of Ed that we're in contact with that want to change this. And I think you're going to see some proposals that will be fairly different than what you've been seeing over the last so many years. And, and, but I would also say that where I think the change is going to come, I would agree, the folks at the top of the tree the UNCs, the Stanfords, the, all the ones that were on, on, on Andrew's list, uh, they, they can do some valuable things. Uh, higher education is rotten with hierarchy. So when Stanford does something or UNC does something, it, it lets everybody, oh, well, that must be okay uh, for folks further down the tree because the folks at the top of the tree are doing it. That's very valuable. But I think where the change will start to occur, where the business model starts to break down is, I, I give you a quick example. I was. I was talking to a woman who was a massage therapist. She'd spent a lot of money at a for-profit institution to get that cert certification. She was in debt, but she really wanted to go back and be a nurse. And she'd gone to all the traditional universities, and these were like Eastern State this and Western State that, and 
tried to, and she's on some kind of list. She, I, she doesn't know where she's going to get the money. It, even in-state tuition, it's going to cost her, you know, fifty, sixty thousand uh, dollars. It's going to take forever. So, our, our director did the Western Governors University, which, if you're not familiar, is a competency-based institution, adult learner focused, uh, and it's eight thousand dollars a year and hasn't raised its tuition in five years. Six. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. It's now six. That's right. This is two thousand. Okay. Uh, and, and so there's an opportunity for her there because of what she already knows. I talked to a woman who's a CPA who wanted to be a high school math teacher. She went to her traditional universities. Same thing, three to four years, lots of money. She went to Westchester Governor. She said, how long is this going to take me to get my degree? And they said, we don't know because we, we haven't assessed you yet. We don't know what you already know. Well, she went in. She did all the assessments for the math courses. She got 26 credits the first semester because she knew math better than almost any high school math teacher in the country. And then she was able to spend her time online courses, but with mentors and teachers. And she did student teaching, learning what she didn't know, which was how to teach that math to a group of hormone-driven adolescents in a high school classroom. And she got out in a year to summer or so. It cost her $10,000. And she's in the classroom now being a very effective teacher. So the to put the elite universities aside for a moment, the Eastern's this and the Western university that, and, and that whole, which is the mass of higher education. How long can they hold out in terms of students when this becomes more pervasive, when Western Governors University is not some unique thing, uh, example we keep having to use over and over again, but there become, this becomes all very well known. Who's going to go? The brand of Eastern State University, this Eastern State University, is not good enough to justify paying the additional money. So I think that's where you're going to see the cracks in the Teflon, and you're going to begin to see people realizing, we better get on this train or we aren't going to be here. And, and that's true of many private universities as well, who are not the elite this privates, is, but the lower. This Laura. is the perfect endpoint. That red light is really getting annoying. Okay, all right, all right. But think, think of what we just said at the bookends of this. We have the massive online courses, the online courses that give access to the education. And we have the processes of assessing the competence that comes out of the courses. Those are the bookends. That's what will make MOOCs meaningful. We thank our panel. <laughs>